Thank you, uh, and welcome everyone. So pleased that you could join us, and so pleased that I have three remarkable people, accomplished and diverse, to join this discussion, and it's a pleasure to be able to moderate. Uh, just to tee this up before I begin engaging our panelists, um, a little bit about why I'm moderating this session beyond the fact that I was asked by BMS and pleased to accept. I'm sitting here bringing two perspectives to the panel. The first is that of a cancer survivor. And so I think survivorship and life beyond cancer, as it were, means many different things to many different individuals. So that survivorship perspective and how we live our lives and what the, the impact to our lives is obviously extremely important. But I think even more so, it's the perspective of the remarkable clients that we at Cancer Care serve. I have the pleasure of leading a 75-year-old organization that directly serves about 195,000 people each year in the United States. Not just the cancer patients themselves, loved ones, bereaved, uh, children uh, of, uh, whose parents have cancer, and these are individuals that often engage with us in many different ways and through the, their journey and through survivorship. And it brings a very, very unique perspective. For those of you that were here this morning, we've heard about the remarkable science, the remarkable advances. And I know personally, when you hear those words, you have cancer, the first thing I think that goes through your mind is, how am I going to survive? And survival obviously is just more than a disease because it is a disease that keeps giving long after a cure or long after treatment. And so we have three remarkable people here to bring different perspectives about this discussion. And so let me start off by asking Tom, and I'm gonna ask each of the panelists generally the same question, but Tom, can you tell us when we think about the concept today of living with cancer, for you as an individual who led a great cancer center in this country, now the chief scientific officer of one of the major pharmaceutical companies in this country, how has that concept changed through the years? So Trish, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I think the biggest issue is that when I think about my practice starting in 1991, and I, I fast forward it to, to what I'm doing now, the percentage of people who are cancer survivors is so much higher. It's unbelievably better than what we were doing in the 90s and certainly in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so we're beginning to understand that with this massive wave of people surviving cancer, both early stage cancers and now increasingly late stage cancers, that that brings, in, it brings increased focus on are we meeting the needs of cancer survivors as well. And you know, when I think about at Yale, the, the work that Tara has done to identify specific problems that long-term cancer survivors have. This is something when I was training, we had no understanding of and no appreciation for the fact that a woman could be cured of DCIS, which, which oncologists will think is a relatively easy, straightforward cancer, and yet still have issues down the road. People can be cured of Hodgkin's disease, people can be cured of colon cancer, and now increasingly diseases like melanoma and renal cell and still have long-term issues. And so I think, Trish, that's been one of the biggest changes in how we look at cancer. And I think for this meeting to focus so much on survivorship, I think that's been a real positive that's development. Great. Great. So Tara, you're every day in the trenches with patients. You're seeing it firsthand. So talk to me about that and your experiences at Yale. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, and I don't know um, how many survivors we have in the audience today, um, but my guess would be that if you are one, that your perspective is just as unique as the next person. Um, and over the past nine years now that I've been at Yale, I've been able to meet thousands and thousands of survivors. Um, you know, while every person's experience is completely unique, some people don't even like the word survivor, which is understandable, um, we do believe that at diagnosis, every individual deserves care for every aspect of them, not just the disease and all of those precision medicine things that we heard about this morning, but to address your emotional needs, your physical needs, your nutritional needs. Um, and to Tom's point, I think we were drawing more attention to that in the survivorship phase, but we also want to back that up into treatment. Um, and while each person is completely individual, there are some 
unifying themes that we've seen in the care of these survivors. So it's not uncommon to have a fear of recurrence, whether it's DCIS or you're living with late stage disease and this is gonna be a part of the rest of your life. It's not uncommon to wonder what should I eat? What supplements should I take to prevent my cancer from coming back? What did I do to cause this to happen? It's not uncommon to wonder, you know, what can I do to prevent it um, in terms of a physical activity regimen? And a lot of patients express some reprioritizing. That's another theme that we see. So I hate my job, I'm done with it. Or, <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to work in this field, this is what I'm gonna do, I don't, I'm gonna find a new spouse <laughs> sometimes, um, not all the time. But you know, it's post-traumatic growth sometimes is what we see, but also some post-traumatic stress disorders, right? So there are some commonalities amongst all the different survivors that we meet, and it's really good for us as providers to hear about these experiences too. So um, to have a survivorship clinic where we just spend time listening has been good for me as a provider as well. So, of course, all we have to do is um, commute in New York City for one day to realize that virtually everyone is dependent upon their cell phones or their iPads. Technology has changed things so much. Um, so, Charlie, talk to us about that. Um, as a CEO of a major company, talk to us about how technology has contributed to and changed the face of survivorship. Thank you, Trish. Um, yeah, Cancer Life is a... Uh, support and research platform that we will let white label to nonprofits to offer up to their members. And Cancer Life collects patient reported outcomes data, um, whether you're a patient in treatment or survivor. Um, interestingly enough, last year we were doing a clinical trial with John Wayne Cancer Institute, a validation study with our platform, and we were recruiting patients on Facebook. We were looking for patients in treatment, that was our primary target. We had over 30% of our participants um, who joined the study were survivors. And when I spoke to each of them about why do they want to join, they said, I have quality of life issues. We know, you know, based on national data, that 30% of patients have quality of life issues. Based on my knowledge, from what I'm hearing from my members inside our platform, I think that's grossly underestimated. And I think the ch biggest challenge that I think I keep hearing the same story over and over again is once that bell is rung after treatment, patients, you know, the, the, the applause starts and they go out into their world and then when they start to have these lingering issues, they go back to their primary and the primary says, I can't help you. And, it, and I feel like they get caught between those two worlds. And it really takes a really good program to be able to monitor these patients and be able to stay in touch to say, come back in and re-engage with us. So. Yeah. so let's talk for a moment about what survivorship looks like today and what special needs there are beyond treatment. I'm, I sit here and I feel extraordinarily blessed to have what I consider to be a very normal and productive life. And certainly, I think, coming back to ringing the bell, Charlie, the whole point, I think, when you start your treatment is survival, survival, and ultimately, hopefully, a cure. But our research, certainly, has suggested that once you're through treatment, even once you're cured, it's still that disease that keeps on giving in so many ways, whether it's compromising your ability to work, care for family, financial issues, et cetera. So I'm gonna to turn to each of you, and Tara, let's start with you. What does survivorship look like today? Um, so I think, you know, today, survivorship, again, I think starts at diagnosis with an awareness of what do I need to do to maximize my health through treatment and then beyond. Um, when patients finish active treatment, they enter into this surveillance mode where a lot of people feel lost in transition, right? And that's where we have a multidisciplinary clinic at Yale, and they're um, replicating this model across the country. It's a, it takes some investment from a cancer center to do it. It's not a money-making um, endeavor, but it's really important. And we see patients and try to help them optimize their health after cancer. So patients, number one, I think to your point, Trish, want to know how am I going to know if my cancer is coming back? What's my plan? How are you going to do surveillance? Can you detect a second cancer? And then, you know, what about my comorbidities? So 
Stage one breast cancer patients, for instance, are more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than they are of breast cancer. And how do we lower that risk right there? Um, and they also want to know how can I optimize my physical functioning, my nutrition, um, and how can I cope? And the coping part, I think, um, what does life look like after cancer? That's where the medical community falls short a little bit. Uh, we're not great at addressing things like financial toxicity. We're getting better, uh, but we need to do it much better. We're not great at, at um, addressing caregiver stress right now. Um, and, and so some of those sort of big picture quality of life issues um, are where we need to partner and um, get some help. So Tom, let me ask you, from the boardroom, from the perspective of Bristol-Myers Squibb, the executives and the staff, what do you think the greatest needs are in terms of survivorship and beyond? And how does Bristol-Myers Squibb look at that and what are you doing about it? So, so I would say the couple of observations I've had just thinking about looking at this over a long period of time is the number of unique problems that are new. Just if you go back to from when Tara started her survivorship program at Yale, the number of different issues that she has to deal with, dealing with cancer survivors, that weren't there even eight years ago or seven years ago when you started. So for example, when you look at what immuno-oncology has done, and Bristol-Myers and Merck and Roche and AZ have all been really important companies in advancing immuno-oncology, yet there's a whole new set of long-term problems that happen to this group of patients who are now surviving melanoma and renal cell far longer than we ever could have imagined years ago. And there's a whole bunch of different side effects. So I think being aware of how our compounds can impact people's long-term outcome. And you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, we used to create, when we, when we were developing chemotherapy, you'd have your toxicity tables. And one thing with chemotherapy is the toxicity with a few exceptions, you know, neuropathy, things like that could be long-term. But now so many of the side effects from IO, for example, are gonna be with people for a long time. That if they develop diabetes, uh, as, a, as a result of I.O., or they develop hypothyroidism as a result of I.O., that's probably a lifetime problem that they're going to be dealing with. So I think the biggest issue has been seeing how this is a field that's not static. It's evolving. And I think from the drug development standpoint, we have to be aware that these are new challenges that we're going to create for patients. So, Charlie, technology. How does technology support survivorship? How can it contribute to uh, a better life um, and, and quality of life for individuals? Well, I use this term patient-reported outcomes data. So that's the data um, that when you're sitting in the waiting room and you fill out your forms, that white piece of paper that you, and I usually just take, you know, a big circle around a, a section of it. That data is not collected in the EHR. That's a sin, and that's the sin of the system, right? So we don't know doctors who are trying to treat only based, their experience, based on their experience, right? So long-term patient-reported outcomes data is not collected. The only people that can collect it are patients that are experiencing it. And it's my goal, my vision for Cancer Life is to be able to offer this de-identified data set, share it with Yale, share it with Bristol-Myers, collaborate, so that we all have a deeper understanding of these long-term implications. So once we know, we can devise a plan, right? But we don't know yet. So that's, that's my mission. So, so one of the good things, if I don't mind Please. jumping in, one of the good things about patient report outcomes is patient report outcomes are really important to pharma companies now yeah. because they tell us how patients, patients tell us how they're doing and what their side effects are. So I think, we are really interested in finding out PROs, and we're investing in PROs, and we're investing in some of the new technology on PROs. The whole idea that there are still studies that we're doing and other people are doing where PROs are on paper is stunning to me. When you think about the fact that how often people are looking around the room here, there's 10 people on their phones, okay? You could be entering on a PRO app what your global quality of life is right now. Maybe all of you are, I don't know, okay? <laughs> but it gives you... Okay, <laughs> but it gives you an opportunity to link that to your EPIC database and your patient database. And so I think that there is hope that we're going to be able to get these things more integrated in the care of the patient. Just to comment on that, I think, I think you know, w one, all the members in my community have said, 91% of them have said, I want to donate my data to the greater good, meaning I want my data to help some other patient make a better decision. 
um, when we bring in the conversation about pharma, they're also more open to sharing that information. And I think if we think about you know, policy issues, you know, the FDA has done an incredible amount of work and, and uh, you know, um, in terms of making it easier for pharma to engage on patient reported outcomes, but I think they even need to do more. Adverse event reporting, which scares Bristol Myers and every other pharmaceutical company to death, needs to be, you know, lowered in terms of priority so that patients can share that data and engage with pharma better. You don't mean lowered in terms of collecting the data in terms of priority? No, no, I just mean the, the, the regulations lowered in terms of the, the impact on you guys. Yes, but I think it's still really important for us to know about safety of drugs. Yes, yeah. but when I'm able to bring you a data set that says yeah. these are all the long-term implications that you may not have been aware of or reported at the time. And, and actually, your point is a really good one because patients report data very differently than doctors and nurses yes. do. We're the worst. Doctors are absolutely the worst. <laughs> we blow everything off. Nurses are better, but they're not perfect. But patients are so much better. Well, patients' definition of an adverse event, a serious one, might be not being able to have a child later in life, and where we might not capture that in our trials, right? So we need to be able to open our minds to what's really adverse to our patients. And one of the things I think that was very interesting when I was initially developing chemotherapy drugs early in my career, and then finally targeted therapies, I learned that the definition of serious diarrhea was seven bowel movements a day above your normal, okay? And I'm thinking, God, from a patient's perspective, is five bowel movements a day above your normal not serious? And, and patients would probably define that differently yes. than doctors would. Yes. Sorry. It's lunchtime, sorry. To get... no, very true. So I heard a couple of times the word collaboration. So let's turn now a bit to collaboration and let me share a couple of my thoughts, but then I, I really wanna hear candid conversation from our panelists. So uh, my entire healthcare career before joining cancer care was spent in academic medicine. And it was interesting, the concept of collaboration and sometimes quite frankly, competition. And I would say coming to cancer care has really redefined the concept of collaboration and the concept of the fact that it takes a village. And I do find more collaboration. We're talking specifically, of course, about survivorship. Of course, absent payers and some other key stakeholders. But I guess talk to me a bit about where you experience. Tara, we'll start with you cross-industry collaboration and how it either has contributed to survivorship and quality of survivorship, or where has it missed the mark, or where is it lacking? So, you know, I think what I mentioned before, um, just to be clear, we have a multidisciplinary clinic where, um, so I'm the medical director, I see patients, I give them their treatment summary and their care plan, but I collaborate with my physical therapist, my dietitian, my social worker, and together you get a comprehensive, personalized assessment and plan going forward. I could never do what my other three colleagues do on my own. Um, or some very skimmed version of that. So, so we collaborate every day on providing comprehensive care. Again, where we fall short are these um, big picture plug-in things that we need to do. So we might be able to see you for two hours, but um, what about that financial grant that you need to apply for? What about your insurance status? And what about um, counseling long-term and long-term programs, and that's where we try to collaborate and be familiar with lots of things that are out there for our patients, not just within Yale's Cancer Center. We don't want to just silo, but we want to be able to refer to, you know, um, lots of different programs across the nation, and so we, we rely on my partners in the clinic to um, understand their field and then help refer people out. Again, I think we could keep doing better, but I, it's exciting to see these other companies coming out to help survivors, and I think we should um, freely refer and encourage people to use them. Tom, in your experience, give me an example, perhaps, of collaboration you think that really made a difference, and where would you, as the chief scientific officer of a major company, like to see collaboration improved? So one thing about collaboration in general, when I, would, when I was a cancer center director and would go out and give talks in the community, I would always get the question of why don't you guys talk to each other? 
by you guys, they weren't thinking pharma. They were thinking, why doesn't Yale talk to Memorial Sloan Kettering? Doesn't talk to Harvard? Doesn't talk. And, and I think that they, I think the public underestimates the amount of collaboration that really does happen. So I think we do have a lot of collaboration that happens in academic medicine. And I actually think that pharma collaborates both with other pharmas and with. Um, and with academic centers on a lot of things. Not on things that are truly proprietary, proprietary, but stuff that's truly proprietary is relatively small about the about the work that we do. But I'll give you a good example of something we're collaborating on. I think all the farmers now are getting together and they're working to think how can we work to define, um, uh, how can we work to define ways of managing common side effects of the new class of IO drugs. And there are ways that pharma's thinking, you know, it's in our interest to all work together to educate doctors to make them better at managing these side effects. And how can particularly rare side effects that might only happen to, you know, one or two patients in one trial. If you put everybody's trials together, you'll find that. The other places with the NCI, we're working on thinking of can we develop, and this is where these electronic devices will be so important, can we develop um, uh, 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 virtual control arms in clinical trials, and can we sort of work to say, is there a, a, a cross-industry way of doing that? So I'm optimistic that we're going to see more and more collaboration with time. Tom, just a follow-up question to that. With respect to payers, if you had one area where you wish that payers would collaborate more with respect to long-term survivorship specifically, what might that area be? So that's a really hard question because if I was to politically answer that the way I'd like to answer that, <laughs> I might not be in, employed in pharma, medicine, or any, or a university, okay? But this you're among friends. Right, right? Because, <laughs> because I think there is a tremendous amount of blame to go around from all of us. Uh, I, I think you've, we've got to come up with a healthcare system that makes it easier for patients to navigate the system. And, and you know, I think guaranteeing access and coverage is crucial. That's a big part of it. But even what you have, it's still extremely difficult in the system we have to allow patients to navigate the system. And I don't care if it's survivorship or I don't care if it's getting a vaccine from a pediatrician. It is still a system that is daunting for people to understand. And it's not a healthcare system and we've got to work to be able to bring that. And I think that's one of the big, and that's not a problem that you can put your finger on and say is one source. It's a collective problem. So Charlie, we all recognize the ever-growing ro role of technology in all uh, sectors of life, and so, so certainly cancer and survivorship is no exception. So talk to us a little bit about how collaboration could help with respect to the utilization of technology. Where are the current barriers that you see, and what are the opportunities? Well, um, this is an easy one, right? Because the collaboration that I'm engaged with is a collaboration between patients. Patients are online. Facebook is typically where they've, they've been the last few years, helping each other both emotionally, but also sharing information you know, and collaborating with each other. What's working for you? We were on the same treatment plan. We were on the same drug. Why is it that I still have pain? You know, these types of collaborations, and that's a unlimited well of knowledge that can step in and help. So that's what you know, Cancer Life and my users are doing, is sharing that information. Now, when it comes to collaboration in the industry, you know, I see Cancer Life as a platform that sits across every health system. So vertically versus horizontally, right? Each health system has their portal, they have their system, they have their data, and it's, it's um, you know, Cancer Life sits across the entire country. So our vision is to be able to take that data and funnel it into each health system, each, each um, stakeholder in the industry. Okay. So I think of us as a community with respect to the on oncology community broadly and all of our different roles. And I think we've seen many examples, whether it be disaster relief or otherwise, where a community that mobilizes can really make a difference. So before we open this up for audience question, I guess I would ask each of you to just spend a moment reflecting on if you had to choose one thing that we could focus on as a community to improve survivorship, to help support cancer survivors, what would that one thing be, either narrowly or broadly? And Tara, I'm gonna start with you. That's a big question. Um, 
I'm going to stick to sort of the academic answer. What I wish I could see happen is that we could um, train more physicians to be specialists in cancer survivorship. And it's, um, I'm palliative care boarded. It's a similar concept, right, where you can take specialists from internal medicine, family medicine, GYN, um, even oncology, and uh, there's this growing group of um, trainees who really want to take care of cancer survivors. Let's train them, teach them how to be um, attuned to quality of life issues, how to surveillance um, long-term side effects of these therapies, and uh, create a community that is uh, recognized for that specialty care that they give. Um, that's what I'm going to say to my wish. Charlie? Well, I think it starts at the moment of diagnosis, honestly. I think, like any, any person, you know, diagnosed, thinking, I want to I wanna get you know, treat it. I want to get healed. I want to get, you know, cured. And I think maybe less and giving patients the expectation of understanding what it truly means, that it's a long-term game, not a short-term game. That the survivorship continues throughout your whole life and you need to be prepared for that because I think the, 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 the mistake that happens is the expectation level. And then when these things happen, that's the post-traumatic stress and that's the depression and that's where did my life go? And being able to prepare people for making those transitions and making long-term thinking. So Tom, your last but never least. So I agree with, with absolutely everything that, that my two co-panelists said. I, I think we're at a, a crisis time in this country, um, a crisis of connection, that we live separate parallel lives from each other, and we live those parallel lives politically, medically, job-wise, and so I think survivorship is no different than anything else. We need to find ways to use technology to enable us to be more connected and to care more about what happens to each other in our communities. I do think one of the things you'll be seeing coming up, as great as Amazon is to deliver our food to us and to deliver our, our stuff to our house, right now we think that's great, but I think you're gonna see increasing times where we need to find ways for people to come together as communities. I think that's a huge issue that we need, and that we need to solve. I don't know how to solve it, but I do think you're gonna see pressure, from, particularly from younger people who are saying, guys, you know, it's not about how many friends you have on Facebook and how connected you are electronically, but can you reach out and actually go to a club and hear some music? Can you go to a restaurant and walk in there and know other people in there and say hello to them? Can you say hello to people on the street? Can you talk to people in a civil way about some of the political problems we have in the country? Or do we only talk to Democrats or Republicans or socialists or nationalists, depending upon what your perspective is? So I think these are enormous problems. I think they're problems. I think I could answer that question for almost any panel that's happening in this city today on almost any topic. Amen. Charlie? I just want to make, I, I couldn't have said it better. That was a brilliant uh, statement. I think, you know, if, if I was to define to a survivor, do one thing, I would say connect. Connect to another survivor or someone that you trust because we know when you connect that oxytocin, that love, does get you through, especially you know through times of, of you know the hardest times of your life. So we have three very accomplished and knowledgeable panelists here. I'd like to open it up for questions, comments. Please feel free. Oh, oh. Thank you very much. That was really incredible. My name is Dana Donafrey. I'm a breast cancer patient, activist, and advocate. Um, I also have a lingerie line for women with breast cancer. I've been talking about these hidden secrets of survivorship for young women with breast cancer for the last eight years. I feel what you guys have all said is really impactful and powerful. Um, I want to know what you really think about moving the needle. Because here we are, we're talking about very large pictures where we, without bringing in the disparity of women's health care into the conversation, is when we continue to be disposable, we will lag in our, in our health care system. But when you guys talk about from the university from the medical side, from the pharma side, from our technology, which is really actually helping patients. We're working on a bottom-up model, right? Patients are having to advocate
for themselves to improve their own lives because our medical systems can't do that for us. So what is your true, honest perspective? If we were to walk out of here today, let's not wait on pharma to get through all of their studies that are gonna take us another five, eight, 10 years to figure out. Technology is moving faster. Medicine is under pressure because they can't spend time with us in their rooms and they can't talk to us and they're so laser focused. How do we really shift the perspective? How do we really change this needle? Because there's nonprofits that are doing work. They're doing, some are doing good work. Some are doing really bad work. You know, how are we as patients and as medical professionals going to come together and bridge the gap? I only expected that question from you. <laughs> I've known Dana for a couple of years now. So um, the answer is, I think we've seen in the last 20 years the power of the internet. I think and I'm obviously going to promote cancer life as that solution. But I will say, I don't care how it happens, but there needs to be a unified patient platform in cancer. There isn't. There is a thousand portals that never get used. There's data locked in the HR. You know, there's just, there's not that one unifying platform to bring everyone together. I mean, patients are basically shards of glass. And some organization, it could be a brand, it could be your brand, Dana. I don't know what it, it's gonna be, but when you unite under one unifying platform, typically internet-based, because that deals mm -hmm. with the integration mm -hmm. problem, things change in an industry really rapidly. So technology, and I would add activism. So I think we, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I just wanna say, um, I've had cancer three times in my life, and I didn't have any real side effects, but I wasn't even followed at 14. But when I had my job there with Boquette, um, I ossified my cochlear, and I'm a deaf. And that doesn't get talked about a lot about deafness with chemo. And also, too, I took a drug called Redland, and I only took it for two months. But I now have tandive dyskinesia. My jaw moves without me knowing it. I twitch, and you see how my legs are twitching. But that's what I'm saying is, when I go online and I talk to people and all that, um, they feel bad, but you know, like I'm breaking my teeth down now, and I just found out I got a $23,000 dental bill. So that's all related after cancer, and I don't really understand how we don't talk about that stuff. Any reaction? You know, uh, the problem is patient note section in the HR is basically a Word document, right? Your, your doctor, whether he transcribes it or he says the words, that, that's trapped inside from a technology perspective. It's not reportable, right? So that data, there are a few people here today downstairs who are spending billions of dollars to try to extract all that data. You know, Flatiron Health and Tempest as examples are using literally, you know, rec uh, character recognition technologies to read those words, natural language processing, and pull that data out. So that's one strategy. The other strategy is to have a group of thousands and thousands of patients in each cancer, because cancer's 30 different pa uh, diseases, and get those patients to report, physically report those symptoms so that we can collect it from a technology perspective. So I think we have time for one more question. Cancer, um, cancer patients, um, pediatric children with cancer from around the world. My question is, can you talk about anything that um, is happening for pediatric cancer patients in terms of their long-term um, prognosis and being followed and anything that is happening either within your companies or your, your medical centers? that um, we as a community can educate their parents and caregivers about. Sharon, Tom. Uh, so the group actually was ahead of us in survivorship um, compared to adults. They realized that um, more kids were surviving and that they were developing and they needed long-term surveillance. So in terms of surveillance, 
the children's oncology group is light years ahead of us at um, understanding a surveillance plan going forward. It is a long time um, running, and, and we can talk offline if you'd like about how, because they, they do commit to you for the rest of your life. That being said, um, I think we are learning a lot more about things like obesity in childhood and cancer survivors and how that plays into your risk going forward. And um, there are, we ha at Yale, um, there's a HEROES clinic, which is a childhood cancer survivor clinic that's focused on not only the long-term surveillance, but also addressing the quality of life and minimizing risk for future comorbidities. Uh, and there's a lot of call to research this and help childhood cancer survivors optimize their health. And I'll just speak, end there. Thank, thank you, everyone. Very much appreciated. Charlie, Tom, Tara, round of applause. Thank you.